Hey folks, we're just gonna give everyone a minute to log on. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for joining us today. We're just gonna give everyone 30 more seconds. Right. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Shannon Von Felden with the Every Life Foundation. Um, and I lead the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates Program here at Every Life. Thank you for joining us today and I am so sorry for the confusion about the link today. We had a Zoom snafu. So thank you so much for finding us today. I know it wasn't easy, um, but hopefully you received our email with a new link. Um, and of course, if you have any technical issues, you can always call in instead of just um, using the video. Um, and please direct any questions to the Q&A box. Caitlin will be keeping an eye on that and will direct any questions to the speakers after they're done speaking. And we have closed captioning available. So um, you can hit the live transcript button on the bottom. We also have uh, foreign language translations available as well. So um, Caitlin or Alyssa will be posting that link in the chat box. So today we're joined by Dylan Simon with the Every Life Foundation to talk about the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. Liesl Broadbridge with the Every Life Foundation uh, speaking on the Speeding Therapy Access Today Act or STAT Act. And we're joined by Melissa Tumblin with the Ear Community to talk about the Alleys Act and Becky Abbott with the National Foundation for Ectodermal Dysplasias to uh, talk about the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dylan Simon. Great, thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, and thank you guys for letting me speak today. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, there's been a lot of fun updates around the reauthorization. Uh, so happy to talk to you guys today about that. Uh, so just want to provide a little bit of background on newborn screening for those uh, for who the issue is new. Uh, so newborn screening is a vital public health program it tests all babies within the first few days of life for certain disorders, conditions that can hinder the normal development. Uh, newborn screening reaches each of the 4 million babies born in the United States every year, and approximately 1 in 300 newborns has a condition that can be detected through newborn screening. Next slide, please. Uh, and the conditions included on these panels can cause serious health problems starting infancy and childhood. Uh, and early detection is really important because early detection allows for early treatment. A key part of newborn screening is to be on these panels is to be able to show that beginning treatment when the newborn is asymptomatic can, can be a huge, can be a life-saving treatment, uh, can really make a large impact. And so that early detection allows for early treatment, uh, which can allow for life-saving treatment. Uh, in addition, early detection not only saves lives, it also saves costs to the overall healthcare system uh, because it avoids the cost of, from, an, from the diagnostic odyssey, from the undiagnosed care. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so a little bit of background in terms of federal newborn screening policy. Uh, in 2008, Congress passed the original Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act, uh, which established the National Newborn Screening Guidelines and helped facilitate comprehensive newborn screening. Uh, prior to that, there had been a, a wide variety in which conditions were screened uh, from state to state, as well as a wide variety of how much newborn screening programs in general were supported at the state level. Uh, and so this really provided the federal the federal government the ability to support states uh, through fund through grant funding uh, as well as create a essentially agreed upon set of rules around newborn screening uh, and so in 2007 right before it was passed uh, only 10 states screened for all of the recommended disorders whereas today every state screens for at least 31 of the 35 recommended disorders uh, with currently 10 states screening for all 35 uh, and that number does continue to go up uh, which is fantastic to see uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now we we'll get to where we're at today. Uh, the authorization of the federal support for these programs expired as 2019 due to the inability to pass the Reauthorization Act last session. Next slide, please. And so here's the current status of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. Uh, so we're really excited about the fact that both bills have been reintroduced uh, this session. 
Uh, so the House introduced their bill on January 25th, and the Senate introduced their legislation on February 22nd. Uh, and we have great co-sponsors, uh, bipartisan support uh, in both in both chambers, which is great to see. Uh, no co-sponsors yet in the Senate, but that's expected. It was it was introduced relatively recently. Uh, in the House, we have 30 co-sponsors. I'm actually happy to announce that that number is now up to 38, uh, which is fantastic to see. Uh, and a really important update for this session, as we're at the last session, is that the language in the House bill and the Senate bill is exactly the same, uh, which is great. Which is great to see. Um, this is similar to the House language of last year, which was great language and just also just makes it easier moving forward when both chambers are working with the same bill. Uh, next slide, please. And so here I want to kind of dig into the key bill provisions. And so some of you have heard me to speak about this before, but in this, in this presentation, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper, kind of pull out some of the more nitty gritty details uh, because they are the same bill and because it has been reintroduced. Uh, so first and foremost, it reauthorizes the Hearst grants to states. Uh, so this is what I was talking about before in terms of grants that support the states, whether it's through improving the red screening programs, helping to educate parents, or helping to improve follow-up care for infants with detected conditions. A really interesting part uh, within this current bill provision uh, that, that builds on the, the current uh, function of the HRSA grants is the ability to provide grants to address pilot studies, uh, which is really important for conditions that are trying to get on newborn screening panels. You need these pilot studies uh, to develop the evidence needed to get on federal panels, uh, as well as it, there's funding to help re-engage babies who did not receive the recommended follow-up appointments. Uh, and this is a really important issue of, of too often um, there'll be a situation in which a, a newborn has identified that they need confirmation testing or follow-up services. Uh, and when the, when the newborn screening program tries to reconnect with that family, it becomes either they can't reconnect or they can't get the, the family back in for a follow-up visit. Uh, and so these, these grants will really help to try to close that gap uh, to make sure that everybody who needs follow-up testing is getting the follow-up testing. Uh, it also reauthorizes the advisory committee, so the ACHDNC or the advisory committee for parental disorders and newborns and children, um, and directs the committee to make the RUST nomination process more transparent. And so the RUST is a recommended uniform screening panel that is the essentially the federal panel that goes through, it's an evidence-based process, and that is a recommended panel that, that states tend to follow. So when I talk about 35 recommended conditions, I'm talking about the 35 conditions on the RUSP. Uh, and the advisory committee essentially acts as an advisory committee and, and a kind of a thought leader on newborn screening. And so the ability to reauthorize them is, is, is fantastic. Uh, in addition, it reauthorizes the CDC grants. So the CDC grants help to ensure the quality insurance within laboratories. And so that's really important because newborn training is a great program, uh, but we obviously need to make sure that it, machines that we're using for the testing are actually working. And so the CDC grants really help to ensure that. Uh, in addition, uh, one improvement within the current reauthorization is it helps to improve data collection. And so it's gonna standardize data collection uh, and really help to track more information and bring more information in so we can understand more about newborn screening and find out ways that we continue to improve newborn screening. In addition, it reauthorizes the Hunter Kelly Research Program. So the Hunter Kelly Research Program is a program, research program within the NIH that oversees newborn screening research. And so this is just a standard reauthorization, which is fantastic because it, it's great to continue to see that newborn screening direct research coming out of the NIH. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, lastly, so there's a, a key part of the provision that we're, of the bill that we're really excited about. And so it directs the National County of Medicine to conduct a study on how to modernize newborn screening. And so this is really a great time with a newborn screening to see how can we continue to improve the program. Uh, it's still a relatively young federal program uh, with the initial bill obviously passing back in 2008. And so this is a really great opportunity as, as medicine is changing, how we diagnose and treat conditions is changing. Uh, how can the newborn training system as we see it now, can it withstand those changes? And if not, how can we modernize it? Uh, and so they're going to look at a wide variety of conditions that are all on the slide right there. Uh, but we're really excited about that because it is looking at a wide ranging aspect of newborn training. It's not looking at just one aspect. It's not looking at just emerging technologies. It's looking at the full system and how can we improve the full system. Uh, in addition, the fact that the national it requires the national Academy to hold at least one public meeting is great. In our opinion, it will allow for patient advocates to to really uh, have their voice be heard. Uh, in addition, it will conclude within 18 months. Uh, it can tell not only the results of the study but also recommendations. And so, it's never. 
this will be a great setup for the next reauthorization. And so while we're still focusing on this one, uh, when we get this passed and this, this study does start begin to occur, the recommendations on how to modernize will really help in the next round of reauthorization. Uh, lastly, uh, it does increase authorized funding levels for the HRSA and CDC programs, which is, which is always great. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so the current advocacy status of the reauthorization. And so we just held uh, Rare Across America meetings with more than 650 advocates, which was fantastic. So thank you all to have joined. Uh, and one of the asks was anyone's screening says laws reauthorization act. And so uh, I'm, I'm gonna take a little credit that we may not deserve, but those eight additional co-sponsors in the house, I, I would imagine was definitely impacted by those Rare Across America meetings uh, because I was able to sit in on a few meetings and a, a, it's a, this is bipartisan support and everybody definitely is in support of the newborn screening program and the reauthorization. And so a lot of times getting co-sponsors is just identifying the bill to representatives. Uh, and so that brings me to our next point in which is we currently have a action letter that is live. Um, and so I'm going to put it right now in the chat box. And so this is a great way for you to contact both your representatives and your senators to ask them to co-sponsor the bill to continue to grow that support. Um, and I think that is it. I see a couple questions, so I will try to answer those right now. Any idea of the one in three? For the one in 300 disorders, um, if whole genome sequencing occurred, uh, so currently through, um, currently newborn training uses metabolic testing. And so the confirmation, so that the kind of the second and third step in the newborn training process will tend to use genetic testing. Uh, but that first initial test, uh, the dry blood spot that's occurring within the hospital uh, is a metabolic test uh, and, and not whole genome sequencing. Uh, in terms of Senator Paul's resistance to the testing language, uh, that is, has not gone away is the short answer. Uh, we're still working with uh, our advocates and our champions on the Hill to, to kind of identify where that's gonna be and, and what sort of resistance we're looking at this, um, this session. Uh, and that's something that we're definitely preparing for. Uh, and one of the ways that we're prepared to do that is, is really to highlight the patient voice and, and make sure that those stories are the ones that people are hearing and highlight the impact uh, of those newborn screening research programs. And so in terms of where it stands at the moment logistically, uh, we're still kind of waiting and, and, and taking our calls and trying to determine where exactly that is. But in terms of planning for if it does come back, uh, we're really hoping to really highlight the patient advocacy stories uh, and the impact of new newborn screening research. And thoughts on the addition of opt-in language such as Rand Paul in the 2019 bill. So that, again, that's going back to the, to the bill. Our last session, we opposed the Senator Paul's amendment. Uh, and in this session, we will continue, if he offers the same amendment, we'll continue to oppose the amendment. Um, again, we're working with our champions on the Hill to, to try to uh, see what's gonna happen in this session in terms of whether or not the, the amendment will be introduced again, um, and really working to ensure the fact that we can pass a reauthorization that we support that does not have uh, Senator Paul's amendment language uh, as currently written in the bill. Great. I think that's perfect. It. I think that's, so yeah, much. I don't see any other questions for you, Dylan. So thank you so much. And um, if folks do have questions for Dylan, you can feel free to reach out to him um, by email. Uh, and if you need help getting his email address, of course, you can reach out to me for it. Um, so next we have Liesl to talk about the Speeding Therapy Access Today Act. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Liesl Broadbridge and I am a genetic counselor and a policy fellow here at the Every Life Foundation. And thank you for letting me speak today. I'm excited to tell you all about the Speeding Therapy Access Today or STAT Act. Next slide, please. So we'll start uh, by briefly first talking about why we need the STAT Act and why it's such a critical piece of legislation. Um, and then we'll talk about the components of the bill and how our rare disease community could be impacted by it. And then we'll finish up discussing um, where it is today. Next slide, please. So this slide will probably not be new to most of you on this call, but rare diseases um, are not so rare. In the US, uh, a rare disease is defined as um, affecting fewer than 200,000 people. And an estimated 300 or 30 million, excuse me, Americans are living with one or more rare diseases. 
And up to 95% of those rare diseases have no US FDA uh, approved therapies. And the development process for a rare disease drug takes an average of 15 years. And when these new therapies for rare diseases are approved, patients can face unnecessary delays and barriers to accessing those drugs. Next slide, please. So what is the STAT Act and how is it gonna help alleviate hopefully some of those challenges? Next slide. The STAT Act is a bipartisan and bicameral community-led bill aimed at improving the development of and access to therapies for the rare disease community. From the start, it has been a collaborative effort conceived by the rare disease community through dozens of um, public forums where all stakeholders have been welcome. And this grassroots legislation is the result of more than a year of collaborative efforts by the rare disease community, partners, and congressional leaders. The process was led by the Every Life Foundation's Community Congress. Next slide, please. What will the STAT Act do? The STAT Act seeks to enact targeted, impactful, and importantly, attainable policy reforms at the FDA to accelerate the development of therapies across the spectrum of rare diseases and disorders, um, and to facilitate patient access to those therapies. The STAT Act will optimize interagency rare disease coordination, stakeholder engagement, and policy development within the FDA by expanding the existing authority of the FDA to create uh, a rare disease center of excellence. And lastly, uh, inform and advance science-based regulatory policies and action by creating a rare disease and condition drug advisory committee. Next slide, please. The STAT Act is comprised of four main components shown here. Um, at the core is the FDA center of excellence, which is sort of the umbrella that will house the other three components which include uh, the creation of a rare disease and condition advisory committee, uh, programs that are focused specifically on ultra rare disease and a rare disease therapy access program. And I'll briefly touch on all of these over the next few slides. Next slide, please. Um, so the, this slide is really about the purpose of the center of excellence. And so although more, each of the more than 7,000 known rare diseases are very different. They face many of the same challenges in successful therapeutic development. And an intercenter institute, or what we're calling a center of excellence, will focus on these unique challenges across rare diseases and provide solutions that can benefit the therapeutic development for many different conditions. And this approach is something that's already been proven successful for cancer patients with the establishment of the Oncology Center of Excellence. Um, with the FDA in 2017. And the Rare Disease Center of Excellence will also build a rare disease knowledge and expertise to inform review decisions, provide additional supports as needed to review staff while developing and furthering policies to support rare disease therapy development and access. And finally, the Center of Excellence will serve as the FDA's coordinating office with rare disease stakeholders, implementing cross-center rare disease and condition-focused meetings and policy development and coordinating regulatory science initiatives for rare diseases. Next slide, please. And with that purpose in mind for the Rare Disease Center of Excellence, this is what it will do. First, the Center of Excellence will leverage the combined skills of regulatory scientists and reviewers with expertise in major disease areas in drugs, biologics, and devices. It will help to expedite the development of medical products and support an, integral, uh, an integrated approach in the clinical evaluation of drugs, biologics, and devices for the treatment of major disease areas. Um, additionally, it will work with the Center for Drug Development and Research, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, as well as other offices across the FDA. It will also convene stakeholders from across the rare disease community, to consider potential changes to labels for rare disease therapies that are approved under the accelerated approval or breakthrough therapy pathways. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute here. Um, next slide, please. The next component of the legislation is the Rare Disease and Condition Advisory Committee. Um, the advisory committee will consist of no more than 15 members um, and will include a wide spectrum of expertise as well as rare disease patient representatives. Members will have expertise in the fields of public policy, law, regulatory policy, economics, patient focus, product development, and patient advocacy. Um, in advising the secretary, the advisory committee will consider regulatory pathways 
clinical trial design needs, qualifications of biomarkers, drug repurposing, and other issues related to the drug review process. Next slide, please. In the space of ultra rare diseases, the Altitude Program or the Accelerating Life Saving Therapies in Treating Ultra Rare Disease Entities um, will make recommendations to address regulatory science and public policy challenges to the development of treatments for these very small populations or ultra rare populations. The recommendations will, fo will focus on manufacturing standards, trial designs, um, regulatory flexibilities and manufacturing needs. Additionally, the proposal builds upon the Secretary's authority under the Orphan Drug Act to include grants to assist in developing practices for, um, uh, for the approval of drugs and therapies to treat small populations. And these grants will be made in consultation with the Altitude Program. Next slide. Uh, and lastly is the domain of access, which will be addressed through the Rare Disease Therapy Access Program. Uh, the proposal seeks to enhance coverage of drugs, biologics, and gene and cell-based therapies to treat rare diseases and disorders so that payer coverage policies reflect the totality of information that's used by the FDA to determine drugs uh, indicated use and importantly population. It seeks also to inform label decisions and so the rare disease community is regularly challenged by payer coverage policies that kind of narrow a broad indication in a therapy's label by limiting access to the population that um, participated in the product specific clinical trial. So examples often include coverage policies that have sought um, to limit access to only the people, the persons who meet the specific age, functionality, or other um, criteria of the clinical trial population. This approach really overlooks the totality of scientific information that the FDA uses to inform their products labels and ultimately undermines access to patients who could benefit from those treatments. Um, the Rare Disease Therapy Access Program will also establish and carry out a voluntary rare, dis uh, rare disease and condition early third party payer feedback program to help inform coverage policies for rare disease therapies and inform clinical trial design, patient engagement, and other data collections. And every year, the program would submit a report to Congress that describes the participation of the program and the impact it's having. And lastly, the Rare Disease Therapy Access Program will create a process to inform Medicaid coverage decisions. So after the approval, um, clearance, or authorization by the FDA of a medical um, product to treat a rare disease or condition, the STAT Act would require the secretary to issue a bulletin to state Medicaid directors containing information to help inform coverage decisions um, on the product by state Medicaid and CHIP, uh, CHIP Children's Health Insurance Program. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, and with that, I, I think we're about at time. So we'll take this um, moment to thank and acknowledge our STAT Act lead co-sponsors which are the um, co-chairs of the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus, Senators Amy Klobuchar and Roger Wicker, and Representatives Gus Bilirakis and G.K. Butterfield. Um, and with the leadership of our co-sponsors, the STAT Act was introduced in both the House of Representatives and the Senate earlier this month. And just like Dylan, I will also give a big thank you to all of the Rare Disease um, Rare Across America advocates who helped bring this um, to their representatives a couple weeks ago during Rare Across America. Next slide, please. Um, and how do we continue taking ac uh, action to support the STAT Act? Go ahead and next slide. As you all know, you are a critical piece of the legislative process. And just like Dylan, I will encourage you all to go to our website at statact.org to get more information and to find out ways to contact your members of Congress. We'd also encourage you to share this, uh, spread the word on social media using the hashtag stat act. Next slide. And with that, I will say thank you for um, letting me speak today and for listening to uh, the introduction of the stat act. If you have further questions, we'll try to do those in the chat, um, as well as you can contact our director of public policy, Jamie Sullivan, whose email is here on the slide. Thank you. Thank you, Liesl. We do have a few questions here for you and, and Annie. Um, 
The first is a question about whether the STAT Act is part of the modernization bill or something separate. Yeah, Shanna, how about for the sake of time, I'll just dig through a couple of these really quickly sure. and then we'll go to the other speakers. And if we have time, we'll come back to any other questions that came up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, the question about the modernization package, that would be FIDESIA. And I suspect that's actually referring to PDUFA, maybe is what somebody's asking about. Um, that, so this was introduced separately um, as a standalone bill. We certainly would be open to any vehicle that um, if this legislation were passed, that this could be a part of. So our hope would, that, would be that this legislation would gain enough momentum to be passed on its own. But if it were to become a provision of PDUFA or some other vehicle, Cures 2.0 or something else, that would be wonderful or it could be passed on its own. Um, another question that came up, um, came up in the chat, but I'll answer it here also, um, was whether or not FDA is the only agency named or whether there are other agencies named in the bill language. Under the um, advisory committee, um, the director of NCATS um, is asked to serve as a member of the advisory committee. Um, the director or representative from CMS is asked to serve as an advise a member of the advisory committee. And then of course, um, the discretion of the secretary, anyone that fulfills any of those other expertise from any other federal agencies could certainly be called to serve. Um, and then um, with regard to interagency uh, collaboration, there's certainly um, collaboration and facilitation between CMS and FDA within the, um, the access provisions. Um, and then I'm just scanning through questions. I just want to make sure I hit some of the high notes. Um, one of the questions is what's the reaction of FDA been to this proposal? Um, we have had engagement with FDA over actually the last two years around this proposal. Um, the first was in 2018, our scientific workshop focused on this and Janet Woodcock and others participated in this. Um, and their request was that we wait until the OND reorg was finished before we move forward with this proposal and this concept. Um, which we did, we have. And then um, we also have had, um, we have had reached out to FDA as well as our congressional champions have on this. And at this point, we're now just awaiting official um, response now that the legislation's been um, introduced from FDA's policy folks. Um, so that is that response. Um, I just want to make sure any um, reporting to Congress would certainly be made public and transparency would be key. And one of the other questions is um, how would STAT help expedite therapeutic development outside of regulatory processes? There is a lot in this bill um, that's really focused on the NFU or the our smaller population therapeutic development, additional funding for ultra rare diseases, although we don't define ultra statutorily in this bill, um, manufacturing standards, uh, toxicity, um, statistical expertise being brought to bear on rare diseases. Um, so we, all the bill text is now on our website. I know it's hard to find on Thomas right now because it's not loading under the name of the bill, but we encourage everyone to go to our website and read through the text of the bill. Um, we're really grateful to everyone in the community that really helped us identify where there are some bottlenecks currently and how we can um, overcome them together as a community. So thank you to everyone that's worked with us on this. We're really excited about it. Um, I think for the sake of time, we'll defer um, other questions and we'll try and answer them in the chat and we'll pass it off to our next speakers. Thank you. Great, well, thank you, Annie and Lisa. And um, I know Annie will be able to answer some more questions in the Q&A. Of course, um, you can always reach out to Jamie as well. His email address is listed here. Um, so next, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Temlin with the EAR community to talk about Allie's Act. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Tumblin, and thank you for joining us today. I am the founder and executive director of the EAR community organization, and I'd like to educate everyone on Allie's Act today which is House Bill number 477 and Senate Bill number 41. These are national level bills that would improve hearing health care for those individuals who require the use of bone anchored hearing aids and cochlear implants. Next slide, please. I'd like to provide some background on Allie's Act. 
So Allies Act is a bicameral, bipartisan national level bill. Both of these bills would ensure that private insurance providers would cover specialized hearing devices known as osseo integrated hearing devices. These are the hearing devices that include bone anchored hearing aids and cochlear implants. Now this bill would provide services for children and adults birth age to 64. It would provide for their upgrades, the surgery costs and any of the other um, services that go along with these devices. Now backing our bill, we have strong leadership and a lot of passion uh, behind these two bills. So our House bill was introduced by Congressman Joe Naguz, and this was in January of this year. He actually reintroduced our bill, and it was the first bill his office chose to reintroduce. Um, he's very passionate about this bill. We have our same co-sponsors uh, leading our bill as well, which are Congressman David McKinley and Congressman Mike Thompson, who are both the co-chairs to the Congressional Hearing Health Caucus. And again, our bill does hold bicameral support being led by Senators Shelley Moore Capito and Senator Elizabeth Warren. And as a reminder, Congressman David McKinley is the only member of Congress who wears a cochlear implant. Now, Allies Act does have many endorsers supporting our bill. This includes many hearing loss associations, but also many medical institutions, including Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Stanford, Weill Cornell, Columbia University, Many um, hearing clinics, including New York Eye and Ear, Mass Eye and Ear. Um, this bill is supported by many otolaryngologists and audiology practices and clinics. And it's also supported by many nonprofit organizations, just like Ear Community, for when we choose to donate to those individuals who have been denied insurance coverage for these very devices. Next slide, please. So why do we need Allies Act? Uh, first of all, I have found it is very difficult to educate the general public, not only on hearing loss, but that there are different types of hearing loss and that with those different types of hearing loss come different treatments um, with different hearing devices. So as I mentioned, Allies Act would cover specialized hearing devices. These are the osseo integrated devices, which are the implantable hearing devices. Uh, these are not traditional hearing aids that go in the ear or behind the ear. Um, these implantable hearing devices are often not covered and denied by private insurers who are compliant with the Affordable Care Act. Here's some pictures below just to help clarify which devices we are speaking about today. Uh, the first image is a cochlear implant candidate. The second image is actually my daughter, Allie, whom this bill has been named after. She is wearing a bone anchored hearing device on a soft band headband because she has no ear. Allie was born without a right ear and no ear canal resulting in hearing loss. And then just showing that, you know, individuals, babies especially, they can be born without ears. And so that's why these devices are very important for them. Um, bone anchored hearing aids can help treat conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. And cochlear implants can help treat severe to profound hearing loss. Now, in addition to individuals being born deaf, uh, there's a lot of other associated congenital birth defects, including microtia and daural atresia, like my daughter has, where the ears are physically missing and there's no ear canal. But also hearing loss can result later in life. And this is not even tied to age. Um, you can often have tumors develop that have to be removed. These tumors are referred to as colosteotomas and acoustic neuromas. And quite often when they are removed, there has already been permanent hearing loss damage. Um, these same devices would also help treat tinnitus, Meniere's disease, and sudden hearing loss. And again, these are the only hearing devices that these individuals would be able to benefit from, not traditional hearing aids. Now the cost for these devices, um, they're expensive. They range between $5,000 and $12,000 each. This is not including the surgery costs or the upgrades for these devices. Um, surgery will range depending on the type of implant, anywhere from 15,000 to over $50,000. Uh, these devices, as I mentioned, again, are not the traditional hearing aids. There is a bill, the over-the-counter hearing aid bill that was passed. These don't include these hearing devices. Uh, these are specialized. They require fittings, programming, and activation. And they also often come along with additional appointments, um, especially if you've had surgery. Uh, these individuals require post-operative care appointments and checkups. Uh, in addition, you know, with insurance providers, it's, it's very challenging and it's, it's very difficult 
but this shouldn't have to depend on the provider or plan that you have or the state that you live in in order to have a, a hearing device provided. Um, so the insurance providers are discriminate, discriminating against many of our community members. Next slide, please. I'd like to educate everyone a little bit on the current state level insurance plans that we have in place for hearing device coverage. So first of all, currently only 27 states offer some form of hearing device insurance plans. And they're, they're all not consistent. Um, each state will vary. And for example, uh, you will have state insurance plans that offer coverage up to certain ages. They will stop at either age 18, 22, or 26. And I don't know about you, but for insurance providers to think that once our children become adults, that their hearing loss is going to improve, get better, or just go away overnight is unacceptable. Uh, we need consistent coverage and we need this coverage throughout adulthood. Also, the services and therapies that are offered under these plans all vary. One state may offer speech therapy services and another may not. Uh, one state may offer certain coverage for hearing tests, uh, whether it's one or two per year and others may not. Uh, as I've mentioned, insurance providers typically deny these, these devices. And um, you know, some are covered. You could have maybe eight people in one state under the same private insurance provider. And of those eight people, half will have hit or miss coverage. Some will be covered in full, some will be covered at a specific percentage, and the other half will be just flat out denied. Um, as Dylan mentioned with the, the newborn screenings, you know, this, this also includes newborn hearing screenings. And when we have a diagnosis that a child or an adult has hearing loss, we should be able to provide um, the technology to help them live a better quality of life, such as the hearing devices. Now, some insurance providers also will go against the word of the medical professional. Um, they will come back denying these devices, stating that you know, these devices are not medically necessary, even though they indeed are medically necessary. This is the very reason why the claim was submitted by the ENT and the audiologist, because based on their professional medical opinion, they believe their patient will absolutely benefit from the use of these devices. Now, some insurance providers um, also may deny coverage based on the state you live in, especially if you're working remotely. So say you live in one state, but there's insurance coverage through your employer who's located in another state. So um, again, there's a lot of inconsistency and a lot of loopholes. Next slide, please. So there is a solution with Allie's Act. Uh, first of all, if Allie's Act becomes law, House Bill number 477 and Senate Bill number 41 would help hundreds of thousands of children and adults have the access to life-changing treatment, allowing them to live their lives they dream, participating in the community, workplace, and school, and enjoying a higher quality of life. So again, we're not talking about the 48 million users here for hearing devices. We are talking about hundreds of thousands because these are specialized hearing devices um, and not everyone is a candidate for these devices. So based on the hundreds of thousands of users, current market sales for bone anchor hearing aids and cochlear implants, and this is across the board, these devices would not cost that much for this uh, act to offer these services to be covered by private insurers. So based on sales from day one when these devices hit the marketplace currently throughout today, it would literally cost less than 30 cents per person per year for these insurance providers to cover these devices. And um, this information came to me, I worked um, with a health economics advisor on this. And so this is, these are real, real numbers. It would not be that much. Uh, insurance providers, and other resource providers could also end up saving more money when individuals are aided with hearing devices. In fact, according to studies by the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, and including studies conducted by the Hearing Health Foundation, when individuals are not aided, um, there's extra risks involved. There's traffic accidents, there's falls. These all add up for extra money that, has to, that have to be paid for by insurance providers. So aiding individuals could help save money. And also, um, recent studies show by the National Institutes for Health that children with severe to profound hearing loss 
who receive cochlear implants at early ages, say from first grade through 12, um, also show cost savings to our educational and school systems. And in addition, overall, they show a lifetime savings. Next slide. So how you can support Allie's Act. Every voice matters. Everyone, we need everyone's help. Um, we're asking advocates who are on with us today, um, representatives, please, please consider supporting Allie's Act. Write to your local congressmen and senators, ask them to co-sponsor and support this bill. And if you're an advocate, tell them why this bill is so important to you. Um, please utilize our one pager and follow up with a phone call in two or three weeks to that representative's office. Also, the link below has been great. Um, this was created by the RDLA Every Life Foundation. Uh, this link takes two minutes to fill out. And based on your zip code and your address, your emailed letter goes directly to your direct local representative um, as the constituent. And that's what we need. So this link has been great. Uh, Allie's Act has been assigned to four committees. We are asking people to write to those committee members, especially if you happen to be the constituent of one of those members. The four committees the Allies Act has been assigned to is um, the Help Committee for the Senate, and then also the Education and Labor Committee, Energy and Commerce Committee, and the Ways and Means Committee for the House. And for any and all information about Allies Act, you can find more information on Ear Community's website. At the link below, we have videos, we have news footage of families being denied hearing device coverage. We have boilerplate template letters, everything that you would need to help support this bill. And in closing, I'd like to leave you with just a couple of quotes. Congressman David McKinley stated, as the only member of Congress with a cochlear implant I know from firsthand experience the difference in the quality of life these devices can provide. Allie's Act would help thousands of Americans with severe hearing loss gain access to life-changing treatment. Here's a statement by Congressman Nagus. Osseo integrated devices are necessary to provide these children the opportunity to develop alongside their peers and will allow adults with the same hearing loss the opportunity for strong, healthy and fulfilling lives. And a statement by my daughter. Allie says she hopes this bill will pass because kids and adults deserve to hear. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can also reach out to me through your community's website um, through the contact menu tab. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, thanks so much for being on today. We had one question that maybe is for you or maybe for Becky. But um, someone was asking about whether there was overlap between um, between your bill, Allie's Act, and the Insur Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. So I, Becky can touch on this as well, but um, no, uh, my Allie's Act bill is specifically for coverage with private insurers for osseo-integrated hearing devices. Um, we know that it's been a challenge with medical codes to have, you know, reconstructive surgeries and other things that the ELSA Act covers. So these two bills are completely separate. They are not overlapping. Um, it, they both would, however, though, potentially give so many individuals such an amazing quality of life if they pass. Great, thank you so much. Well. Um, now that's a good segue <laughs> into our next speaker, Becky, um, who's going to talk about the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act, which was just reintroduced. Thank you, Shannon, for the introduction, and um, thank you, everybody, for joining today. So um, as Shannon said, I'm Becky Abbott, and I am the Manager of Research and Treatment for the National Foundation for Ectodermal Dysplasias, and I'm also the co-chair of the NFED Family Driven Advocacy Committee. And today I'm here to talk about the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. Um, so the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act, which is also known as ELSA um, to our advocates and also on Capitol Hill, will ensure that private group and individual health plans do not deny or delay medically necessary treatments um, of congenital anomalies. Uh, so while the um, ectodermal dysplasias community um, advocates for ELSA, we're advocating for it because our families receive denials and delays 
for oral and dental issues. Um, so that's why we're advocating for the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. Um, the foundation for ELSA is that it is broadly written and that's based on all 50 state statutes. So all states across the United States have uh, state statutes that will cover the repair of congenital anomalies. Um, and for various reasons, um, there's several loopholes that insurance companies will uh, use to deny our families these medically necessary treatments and repairs. Um, so just a little bit of a background about congenital anomalies. About 4% of children who are born in the US are born with a congenital anomaly or a birth defect. Um, there are several different types of congenital anomalies. Uh, some of them are listed here. So oral defects, cleft lip, cleft palate, skeletal defects, um, vision defects, such as congenital cataracts, uh, hearing defects, and then um, other loss of body functions. So the bottom line for ELSA is that ELSA was broadly written um, off of those 50 state statutes to include the repair of any medically diagnosed congenital anomaly that would would require medically necessary treatments um, or surgeries or devices or items. So um, for our families, we need uh, dentures, implants, bone grafting um, that would benefit from the passage of the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. So just a little bit of an update um, since we're in the new Congress, which is the 117th Congress. Elsa was just introduced two days ago. Um, in both the House and the Senate. And um, upon reintroduction, we received 28 uh, co-sponsors in the Senate, 14 Democrat and 14 Republican. Um, those will also, uh, those numbers will also go up. I believe we have an additional four uh, Senate members that should be added in the next couple of days, two Republican and, and two Democrat. In the House, we have 133 original co-sponsors. Um, and that number should also go up to about 140 by the end of the week. Um, in the Senate, the Senate bill number is S754 and it's led by our uh, amazing Senate co-sponsors who are Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin and Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa. Uh, in the House, the House number is HR 1916 and that's led also by our incredible leads in the House which are uh, Representative Anna Eshoo of California and Representative Drew Ferguson, who is also a dentist from Georgia. Um, the bill was also introduced, uh, referred to four different committees, which is the Senate Help Committee, uh, the House Energy and Commerce Committee, the House Education and Labor Committee, and the House Ways and Means Committee. And we do have um, co-sponsors from all four of those committees who have um, signed on as original co-sponsors. Next slide. So how can you help? We're asking all, everybody who's on this um, webinar to join us in advocating for the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. Uh, we need you to reach out to your federal legislators. There's several easy ways, which have already been mentioned, but I'll go through them again. Uh, you can post on social media. You can tag your legislators um, so that they can view those posts. You can be creative. You can share pictures of your family. Uh, you can use our hashtag, which is hashtag ensuring lasting smiles. Um, you can use our easy web tool. It only takes one to two minutes. The uh, letter is already pre-populated after you enter your address and you can actually edit the letter to include a, a brief portion of your family story. Um, I just wanna mention those family stories and your personal um, struggles are what has uh, garnered so much support for the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. We've been able to um, really garner strong bipartisan support over the past few Congresses because of those stories. So I would encourage everybody to make sure that you include your personal story um, on that easy web tool when you use it. If you have a virtual or in-person meeting with your legislators, um, just like any event that you have, uh, for example, Rare Across America, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act and ask your legislators to co-sponsor. Um, if they've already co-sponsored, ask them to uh, help move 
ELSA forward through Congress and reach out to their colleagues and um, committee members to continue to uh, maintain that strong support for ELSA. Uh, if you represent a patient advocacy organization or a professional organization, you can sign on as an official supporter of ELSA. Right now we have uh, a little bit over 50 organizations who have signed on who are advocating for ELSA. Um, there's a link there. You can also find the link on the NFED webpage. We also have a uh, private Facebook group that you can join. Um, I would encourage anybody who would like to know the most up-to-date information on the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act to join that Facebook group. We often have information on um, where ELSA is in Congress, uh, the next steps that ELSA will be taking on its journey, who has co-sponsored, um, what or who, have, who is co-sponsored in which state, and then also all of the links to the different tools to advocate for ELSA. Next slide. And of course, uh, we invite you to join us for our ELSA, um, or our advocacy day, which we'll be advocating for ELSA. So our fourth uh, annual NFED virtual advocacy day on Capitol Hill will be uh, uh, Wednesday, April 28th, 2021, of course. And this is open to anyone who would want to advocate in support of ELSA. So if you are part of a patient organization that would benefit from ELSA, we would encourage you to join us. If you're a patient organization who um, wouldn't benefit from it, but you, you strongly believe in this legislation, we're happy to have you um, also advocate for ELSA. The event is free to attend. Uh, we do schedule all of your legislative meetings for you. Um, you usually are not alone in those meetings. If other advocates um, have registered either from your state or from your district, you will be grouped with them. We also provide training. We have Advocacy 101 training, um, and then also training for all of the specifics, um, including your asks for the day on the hill, um, what you should share um, in regards to your family story. And it's really a great day to spend with um, other advocates from all other patient organizations um, in some professional groups as well to um, have our voices heard and raise them together. So um, you can register by Friday, uh, March 26th, and I've also included a link there to register. Next slide. So um, I just wanted to leave my contact information here. And I wanted to say um, thank you everybody for your support um, in advocating for ELSA. And um, with the last comment here, I just wanted to say, um, let's protect all Americans born with congenital anomalies. And um, it, just in closing, I wanted to mention, um, I know Melissa had um, talked a little bit about um, the overlap within uh, ELSA as, as well as Allie's Act. And I just wanted to address that. So. Um, we've heard from several different offices that they believe that this bill is disease specific and that it's only for oral and dental um, treatments. However, this bill actually is for all congenital anomalies. Um, so if no matter what um, congenital anomaly that somebody is born with, if it is an, an ear um, issue or um, eye issue, that it will cover the treatments and it will cover um, whatever is needed as long as that congenital anomaly and that um, issue is uh, medically necessary. And that does need to be um, diagnosed by a medical professional. So as long as it is diagnosed as a congenital anomaly and that the treatment needed is medically necessary, um, then it would be covered under this bill. So I'm not sure um, if anybody else has any questions in regards to that. Um, but I just want to say thank you to everybody who's here today, and we really appreciate everybody who's uh, advocating for ELSA. So thank you very much. Becky, this is Melissa with your yeah. committee. I just would like to add again, yeah. um, you know, Allie's Act is for hearing devices. And even though ELSA covers, like I was talking about medical codes for coverage for, you know, cosmetic surgeries, reconstructions, cleft palates, uh, treatoplasty, things like that. Allie's Act is for devices, but remember, Allie's Act covers individuals who don't have any anomalies. It's um, cochlear implants as well. These individuals just have hearing loss. 
you're just born with a congenital hearing loss and that cannot really be restored through any other reconstructive surgery. So we have devices that are, we have individuals that are affected with um, genetic anomalies like microtia and atresia, but then we have individuals who, who are not. So it's covering medical, medically necessary hearing devices that are grouped into osseointegrated devices for our bill. I right. hope that helps clear things up. <laughs> oh no, and what I was gonna say is so, this this does have some overlap. I'm, I'm not saying they're the exact same. It does have overlap in that um, our bill does cover um, devices as well. So our children need um, dentures, which is considered a device. So that would be covered as well um, for the hearing community. And of course, it would cover um, different hearing devices for the eye community. It would cover lenses, like different lenses that are needed. Um, for congenital cataracts. So I understand it does cover the congenital portion of it. Um, it just wouldn't cover if it wasn't a congenital anomaly. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? I don't see any other, I don't see any questions in our question box, um, but I appreciate both of you being here and um, walking us through the differences in the two bills. So um, thank you to um, Becky and Melissa, as well as Dylan and Liesel for speaking today. Um, save the date for our next webinar. It will be held on April 22nd at noon. And if you would like to speak or if there are particular topics that you'd like presented on the next RDLA meeting, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself. Um, and of course, we'd like to thank our sponsors um, who make our uh, webinars possible. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, we look forward to seeing you in April. Have a great day.